Well, um, the character is about 85% me, the other 15% being an extremely sick mind. People would tell me, oh, you're very funny. You ought to go, you ought to, go to Broadway. And, and I would, yeah, yeah, that's easy for you to say, but I'm the guy who has to go to Broadway and fall on my face and then come home. So anyway, I, I just, I've got to, um, I had to find this out. And, and I would, I, I wasn't thinking of stand-up or anything. I'd just get these ideas and I'd write them down. Uh, he, another guy and I, Ed Gallagher and myself, were doing a, what I call a poor man Bob and Ray type program. Uh, so I'd get ideas and I'd write them down. And I remember there was one time, uh, Bill Daly and I, we knew each other in Chicago. Bill was a, a floor manager for, at, at NBC. And uh, he, he was trying to break into stand-up and, and I had done a little stand-up at that time. And I had written a thing called the, the Grace L. Ferguson um, Airline and Storm Door Company. And uh, Bill said, uh, he, he, had a, he had a date come off. He said, could I, this would be, I hadn't made the album or anything. And he said, could I borrow the, the Grace Hill Ferguson airline? And I said, yeah. I said, go ahead, Bill. I got, you know, I don't have anything coming up. You know, no, nothing on the horizon. And uh, so I, I made the first album. That was very successful. And they wanted another album. And I was one cut short. So I called Bill up. I said, Bill, uh, I got to take back the Grace Hill Ferguson airline and storm door company. And Bill said, oh, you, that's my strongest bit. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, Bill. I just lent it to you. I got out of service in 54, and I worked for about two years as an accountant. So that would take me to about 56. And I think that's about the time I decided that... Um, I had to find out if I was any good, and, and I was doing the, the radio program, but it wasn't, we weren't making any money. We were losing money, as a matter of fact. Um, and my, the guys I'd grown up with, they were getting married and having kids and buying homes, and, and I was taking part-time jobs at, uh, uh, at Goldblatt's department store in Chicago. And, uh, and I was thinking to myself, you have really, screwed up you really have you've screwed up your life you know I don't, I don't know if you can ever I guess you'll have to go back to accounting but you know but there's this one thing coming up well I'll, I'll wait till after that and then there was this other thing coming well I'll wait till after that and then um, a, a friend of mine uh, Dan Sorkin was a disc jockey in Chicago and uh, I had done some i had been on his program he had a, a program which came on after Jack Parr so the Warner Brother record people were coming through Chicago. And uh, Dan said, I have this friend of mine who's, I think is very funny. And they said, well, we'll, li we'll listen to some, some of his stuff. So Dan called me up and said, you know, put some of your stuff down on tape and I'll play it for him. So I, I, at that time, I think I had the submarine commander, uh, Abe Lincoln, and the driving instructor. Those were the three routines I had. So I put them on tape and I brought the tape down to Dan and he played them for the Warner Brother people. <clears throat> and um, they said, okay, okay, uh, yeah, we think it's funny. We'll give you a, uh, we'll record you uh, at, at your next nightclub. And I said, well, see, we have a problem now. I've never played a nightclub. <laughs> so they said, well, we'll have to get you into a nightclub. And uh, it took some time. I found out recently, it took almost a year before they could find a club that would take a chance on a guy who had never played a nightclub before. Um, and th then, th then it was New Year's, then all of a sudden it was, uh, do you want to do six or eight Ed Sullivan's, you know? <laughs> Normally, th you know, a guy will knock around for years and years and years and, and finally get that breakthrough thing, whether it be a, a record or an appearance on Ed Sullivan or whatever. And, and, and he's, for 20 years, he said, you know, if I ever make it big, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Well, I didn't have that. All of a sudden, it was it was thrust upon me, and I wasn't really ready for it. Um, so I had to learn my craft as I was appearing in front of 
three, four, five thousand people, you know, which was, that's why I say that, that one night at the Sands was that I became a stand-up comic. Because I, I said to myself, oh, it doesn't matter what happens, I'll handle it. The good ones come to you fully formed. It's a burst. It's just, it, it, once I got the idea for Abe Lincoln, it was, well, you want to make it six minutes? You want to make it 11 minutes? How long do you want to, how long do you want to make it? Um, They they, they they cogitate and then they and then they they come forth f fully born, you know. Yeah. But that's what you're afraid of. You're afraid of. Did I hear this somewhere? This is coming too easily, you know. And maybe this is a routine I heard somebody do, but I don't remember who it was. It, it, I I and for I didn't listen to other comedians for that reason. I was afraid that I would. I inadvertently start doing their act. The comedian, you're you're out there without a net. You're, you're you know, they're saying, I don't think you're funny, you know. <laughs> so that's why you hide behind it as much as you can, as long as you can, hide behind somebody else. Uh, and if there there there's a, a a joke that illustrates this. There are a lot of jokes that they're, they're, to me, jokes are like uh, Aesop's fables for adults. They, they kind of help you, they kind of prepare, prepare you for life. Um, two comics, two comics been knocking around for years, no, nothing much ever happened. And one comic says to him, he said, he said, it was, boy, I don't know what's going on. He said, he said, you know, my acting, it's nice, you know, people have nice laughs and people enjoy themselves and it's not great, you know. He said, but I was working with Stephen Eady last week and, and the audience was incredible. And they, and I, I went off and Stephen Eady came on and the people were still applauding for me. And Stephen Eady said, well, would you want to bring uh, uh, Ernie back out? And, and they brought, and I did another 10 minutes. He said, and then two weeks ago, I, I'm opening for uh, Tony Bennett same thing. He said, I walk off stage, the people are still applauding. Tony says, he said, then last Thursday, I, I, went, I died. And the other comics said, yeah, I heard about that. <laughs> Co comedians, we, we tend to talk about our failures and not about our successes. Um. If you talk about it, then, then maybe it won't happen again. That's kind of... Because it's 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 always lurking out there. It's uh, even even now when I I'm 51 years I've been doing it. Uh, about six o'clock I'll start pacing up and down in the room until the show. Is this going to be the night? <laughs> Are they going to be dead? You know. The source of your material is people, but as you become more recognizable. People are more aware of you, and and you lose you lose the source of of your material. You have to work at it. You really have to be observant. You, um, you have to. You're never really on vacation. I mean, you could be in Hawaii on the beach, and some guy's walking along. He's got a funny walk, and you say. I got to remember that. That's a funny walk. I may need that one day. That's, you're, you're always filing away these little scraps of information. Peter Sellers went to, uh, when he was doing um, Pink Panther, I think it was, and he, he hadn't decided on the character yet. And he and his wife went to Paris. You know, of course, they lived in London, so going to Paris was like going to Santa Barbara. You know? And... Uh, they had a waiter, they, went, they were in a restaurant, had a waiter and Peter came back and told Blake Edwards, he said, I, I think I have, uh, there was this waiter and I think I'm gonna use him. And that became the basis of the of fin. Do you have a fin? <laughs> Is that your dog? The funniest stand-up that I have ever seen in my life was Richard Pryor. Without, without question. Um, I received the Mark Twain Award in, uh, um, 
and Richard who received the, was the first recipient of, of the Mark Twain Award. <clears throat> and it was interesting, when I received the award, I pointed out that what Mark Twain did was kind of what Richard Pryor was doing, that Mark Twain was saying, this is what life is like on the frontier at the turn of the century. And Richard was saying, this is what life is like in the inner city. Um, I, I don't find the language offensive. It's, it's a language of the inner city. And, and but for Richard Pryor, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know that. I, w I wouldn't know that world. And, and, the, and the interesting people that, 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 uh, that lived in that world. Yeah, let's talk about Richard Pryor. Just one more question. I mean, mud, like Mudbone, it, it, to me, Mudbone, his, one of Richard's routines, is it's beyond comedy. It's, it, there's another level. It, it's uber comedy or something, but it's, it's beyond. It, it's poignant. It, it's, it's accurate. It's hysterically funny. I think he changed comedy. For, if one man could change comedy, he, he did. I went in to do the, the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. So I had a dressing room and a knock at the door and, uh, and there was John Belushi. And he said, I'm, I'm John Belushi. I said, yes, John, I know, I know who you are and I, I love your work on Saturday Night Live. He said, do you remember you were in Chicago years ago and you went to a Cub ball game and a, a bunch of kids came up and wanted your autograph. And I said, yeah. He said, I was one of those kids. <laughs> Maintaining the integrity of, of, the, of the persona you've created. My, my kids, when they, when they listened to the comedy album that I made in, the, <clears throat> in 1960, they said, you know, Dad, that isn't your voice. And I said, no, I know. Um, the voice changed a little, so it wasn't you. It, it, it was this other person that's very similar to you. But there's a little voice change that, <clears throat> that I do that doesn't make it me. When, when you first start out in stand-up, and I think it's true of, of, of most stand-ups, you're, you're doing somebody else until you feel, then gradually you just kind of you kind of drop that person and, and you let a little more of yourself come out and, and oh, well, that wasn't too bad. Okay, I, I'll let a little more of myself come out. And then, uh, and then before you know it, you're out there and you've dropped the, the other person. But I think everybody starts out be, because it's safe. It, it's, um, you know, if a joke doesn't work, well, it, it isn't because they don't think you're funny, it's because th they don't like that guy that you're hiding behind. And then, <laughs> I remember in Vegas, um, I, I, had a, I had a habit, <clears throat> I was playing the sands, and I, before I go out, it was like a ritual, I'd always go out and I'd peek through the curtain and see if I could pick out what I thought might be a trouble table and uh, they, they're kind of loud, and I think that guy's had too much to drink. And, and then there, I was backstage in the dressing room, and I was talking with my manager, and then I heard my bomb music, and I thought, I, I, haven't, I haven't had a chance to look at the audience. And then it, it occurred to me, well, that's all right, because whatever happens, you'll deal with. <laughs> that's when I became a stand-up comic. I think what a stand-up brings to a, a show, aside from timing and, and things like that, <clears throat> is, his, is his knowledge of himself. Um, in other words, a writer would, could come up with a line and, and you'd say, yeah, it's, it's very funny, but, but I wouldn't say that. You know? and, and that's what, that's the role of the stand-up comic, is to maintain the integrity of this persona that he's created. 
Jack Benny was a stand-up comedian. George Burns was a stand-up comedian. But their television shows became uh, just extensions of their radio shows and, and the characters they had, they had created. Um, It, it's funny because some some stand-ups have been very successful, Bill Cosby and Jerry Seinfeld and Ray Romano, and, and others haven't. Um, it, it isn't surefire. It isn't uh, Ro uh, Roseanne. Um, you know, you have the timing, which you know how to time a joke. I remember Susie used to, Suzanne would come up to me and she'd say, because um, she had, primarily play dramatic actresses, the birds and things like that. And she said, I don't get this joke. And it was a joke about lawyers or something. So I explained, well, yeah, that's, uh, here's a lawyer joke. And so then a couple of weeks later, she said, is, is this another lawyer joke? I said, yeah, it's another lawyer joke. <laughs> when we were sitting down talking about what occupation I should have and where we should live and, and that kind of thing. Um, and they said, well, Bob's, you know, because of the telephone conversation, uh, he's a listener, you know, and so we need an occupation where he, where he listens. So they suggested um, a psychiatrist. And, and I thought, I felt, well, I don't know, psychiatrists kind of deal with seriously disturbed people and much as I would personally like to get humor out of it, I didn't think it was, <laughs> I didn't think it was right for television. So we made it a, um, we, we made it a, a, a psych, uh, psychologist. Well, um, the character is about 85% me, the other 15% being an extremely sick mind that <laughs> enjoys the macabre. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would say so. I would, but it, 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 there, there was always that feeling that, uh, well, you know, Bob's, Bob's just Bob's doing Bob, you know, you know. Uh, and the, the truth is, when the words aren't your words, and and you got to hit marks on the floor, um, that's acting, and it, it quits. Be, you quit becoming Bob, and you become an actor. So, uh, I, I felt very comfortable in that in that persona. I tend to find comedians tend to find humor in the macabre. It, it's kind of if you make fun fun of it, it'll it'll go away. You know, uh, how how do you deal with it? You something terrible, you, you deal with it by making fun of it, and then, then you move on, and you, you've dealt with it. As near as I've been able to discern, we were the first couple that shared a bed. Even um, Dick Van Dyke and Mary Tyler Moore had twin beds, and uh, it's very interesting because uh, television changes so much. It, it, when the first show went on, the Bob Newhart show in 72, 72 to 78, uh, there was no cable. There were, uh, we were doing like Super Bowl numbers. We were doing 42 shares, 43 shares. There was no competition. But then cable came along. And, and what you, I think what you see today is, is the networks trying to emulate cable in terms of what they could deal with. Um, I mean, I loved everybody that loves Raymond. I thought uh, I thought Ray was great. I thought it was a beautifully cast uh, uh, show, and, and and well, extremely well written. Uh, but some of the areas th that Ray got into, we could never have gotten. If we sent a script to to CBS, they w they would have said, "You're kidding, right? You 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 don't you aren't really going to do this," you know. So it, it's television now, network shows are kind of, they're competing with cable and they have to compete with what cable is able to do, which is, you know, cable isn't regulated, but, but uh, network television is. 
there is a very interesting story that um, I learned from one of the masters, Jack Benny. And this was a story told me, I, I believe it was Freddie de Cordova, who was his producer for many years. And if I have it right, Ronald Coleman was a guest on the show. And they were just doing a table reading. And, uh, and Jack would say, um, oh, oh, uh, give, give that line to Dennis. It's fu it'd be funnier coming from Dennis. You know, that's, and so have Mary do that, do that. And he was giving away all his, all his best lines. And Ronald Coleman said to him, Jack, you gave away all your best lines. I mean, those were all big jokes, big, strong jokes. And Jack said, yeah, but um, I'll be back next week. <laughs> so if you want to be back next week, uh, it's an ensemble show. Yeah, you can, you can grab every line and... Um, and last 13 weeks and out, or, or you, can, you can share and be generous and stay on for six, eight years. When we first did the pilot for the Bob Newhart show, I, um, I said I didn't want any kids, because I didn't want to do a show where uh, Daddy was this dolt who constantly got himself into situations, and then the, the wife and the kids huddled together and now how do we get daddy out of this, you know? And then they, they finally, they get me out of it and then we're all smiling and they say, yeah, daddy's adult, but we love him, you know? And I said, that is the, the kind of show I want to do. So it was in the sixth year of the show and they sent me a script. Usually I got the script Friday night when we taped and then I'd read it Sunday. So I read it and Susie is pregnant. You know, and this was one of the things I, I said I didn't want to do, so I called up Mike, Mike Zinberg, the, the producer, and I said, I said, I, I read the script. He said, oh, oh, how'd you like it? I said, it's very funny. He said, oh, we weren't sure you, you were going to like it. I said, no, there are a lot of good jokes. I said, who are you going to get to play Bob? <laughs> he said, okay, okay. So if... If you ever see it in rerun, we made a dream sequence out of it where Emily had this dream that she was pregnant. We were rehearsing for the pilot and we were running. I, I, at that time, at, at shows were supposed to run like 27 and a half minutes, something like that. Now it's like 24 or 22 because the rest are all commercials. Um, so he, he said, uh, Bob, can, could you run some of the speeches together? You know, because we're the show is running long. And I said, Lorenzo, this stammer has, has, has gotten me a home in Beverly Hills and I'm not about to change it, so you better take some words out. <laughs> and the stammer is, it, that's the way I talk. It's not like a, an affectation. It isn't, it isn't something I created for the character. That's the way I talk, which I think is a sign of intelligence, but I, I can find no evidence that supports that. She was her own person, and people identified with her. They identified with me, and they identified with her, and they identified with the two of us together, that they had friends who were like Bob and, and Suzanne. Um, I, I remember exactly how it happened. I was, um, Susie's recollection of it is different than mine, but she, she said we we're both on the Tonight Show together. I, I don't think we were. Um, I think she was on with Johnny, and my manager Arthur Price at that time said, uh, "I found your I found your new wife," and I, I said, I, "Well, I didn't know she was missing." You know, he said, uh, "Boom boom," <laughs> and um, he said, "Suzanne Plachette," and I said, "She." He's, that she was on last night with Johnny Carson, and I think the chemistry would be great between the two of you. And um, I said, well, I, I don't know. Susie's a big star. Do you think she wants to do uh, weekly television? And he said, well, I'll, I'll make a phone call and find out. Well, it turned out Susie wanted, she wanted to raise a family. She wanted to settle down. And uh, uh, so it 
it was great. It was it was just that chemistry. I told Mary Fran when we when we started Newhart that I said, Mary, you're going to have one of the toughest jobs on television because they're going to compare you to Susie and whatever it was. Susie and I had this chemistry, and it's it's hard to it's hard to catch lightning in a bottle, you know. We were having lunch in the in the cafeteria of a, a, a small Hilton hotel. I was watching people come in and there, watch employees come in. And it, it struck me how similar um, the hotel was to um, to the Bob Newhart show, because you had the, you had the work um, locale. Um, when I go to the office, and, and Jerry was there, and and uh, and Carol, mm -hmm. Marsha. Uh, and then you had the home atmosphere where uh, it was Bill and uh, and Suzanne. And I thought to myself, well, that would be a good, a, a good place to start, a, a hotel, a small hotel, because you have the the guests who were in effect my my uh, patients, that no matter how strange they were, you had to be nice, you had to be nice to them. <laughs> I remember. Uh, one time, uh, Jack Riley created that great character, Mr. Carlin, and uh, I was having a, a conversation with him. I said, how, how did last week go? And he said, it went fine, Dr. Hartley. Um, he said, uh, uh, Saturday, I was possessed by the devil. And of course, being a psychologist, I had to say, well, do you want to go with that, Mr. Carlin? You know. So no matter how outrageous the guests were, you had to treat them as, as they were guests. And then behind the scenes, the, the, uh, the Julia Duffy and Tom Poston and uh, Peter Scolari, uh, that, was the, that was the work element. So, I, I, so Barry Kemp um, and I got together in creating the pilot. And he said, well, what do you think of of like an inn, and I thought I said, well, yeah, an inn would work. Um, you'd have the same thing. You'd have the work atmosphere and the home atmosphere, and you could take advantage of a lot of things that, like in Vermont, the town meetings and and witches and a lot of that stuff, which we did. Um, so Barry, he he went to New England and drove around and kind of took in, and he wrote the pilot, and they gave it to me. And uh, I had it on the table, and I kind of circled it for a couple days. I didn't, I, I didn't open it and start reading it, because I, I was thinking to myself, well, what if it's, what if it's not as well written as the Bob Newhart show was? Uh, and then picked it up and read it and, uh, and loved the pilot, and, um, and we were off and running again. And that was the way you did shows at that time. Lucy and All in the Family and, um, and Jackie Gleason, they, they were all done in front of a live audience. And you also found things, the writing was better and the, and the actors were better because of the, the live audience. And the first time we, we used Larry Daryl and Daryl, I found a a witch's body in the again the witch was we could take advantage of the northeast and and the history of witches and so I found a witch's body in the basement and uh, and it, it really made um, Joanne Mary Mary Fran very very nervous and she oh Bob uh, uh, Dick you've got to get it you have to get it out of out of it so I I, I looked up in the yellow pages and there was a a thing called Anything for a Buck. There was a company called Anything for a Buck. And I got on the phone. They always tried to write a phone conversation <laughs> into the show. And uh, so, so I, and I was talking to Larry, except you didn't hear Larry's part of it. And I said, well, uh, I said, we need somebody to help us out. And he said, well, we're really busy and we, we couldn't possibly get, get to it until next Thursday. And I said, oh, that's too bad. Now I need someone. He said, well, just uh, out of curiosity, what, what is it? And I said, we, we have a witch's body in our basement. 
And he said, we'll be right over. So <laughs> that was hilarious. So they, they walk in, and uh, I have a conversation with them. And um, I said, how's it going? And, he, and uh, Bill says, uh, oh, I, uh, I threw my back out last week, uh, crawling under houses. I said, oh, that's kind of dangerous work. He said, well, it wasn't work. I just, I enjoy crawling under houses. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they became a running, they, they did probably half our shows of, of Newhart. <laughs> and every time they came in, I, I always put myself behind the counter because I knew that there was going to be about 20 seconds of applause. So you had to just kind of lock yourself and pretend like you were reading mail or something. <laughs> this was going on. And they walk in, they get their 20 seconds of applause. And, Hi, I'm Larry. This is my brother, Daryl. This is my other brother, Daryl. And, um, and then when they leave, they get another 20 seconds. of. Uh, <laughs> but without a live audience, we wouldn't have known that because immediately after the show, I went to the writers and said, you know, let's write another script with these guys in it. The, the audience loved them, you know. You, you, can't, you don't find that out on a single camera. I had to do a single camera a couple times. My, my dresser... Ralph Slane uh, had a heart attack on the show and actually died that week. And, and I said to the producers, I said, I, I can't do a show in front of an audience this week. It just, it's just, it's too painful. Ralph had been with me for a long time. <clears throat> and I hated it. I just, it was so sterile. Um, you'd do a line and then you'd count one, two, three, and then you'd do the next. Um, in, in fact, today, if I hear a show without, if I hear a show that's all laugh track, I won't watch it. That, that isn't the genre. That isn't, I, I, I think the writers write harder. I think the actors act harder. It came from my wife. It was in the sixth year of Newhart, which uh, eventually the Newhart went for eight years, but in the sixth year. Um, Nine o'clock Monday night had not been a hit time slot for a long time, uh, ever since MASH. So they put us in at nine o'clock and we, and we build it into a hit time slot. And, but then in about the sixth year, they, they, they would move us around. They'd take us out at nine o'clock, they'd put us at 8.30 and they'd put a new show in at nine o'clock. Or they'd put us at 9.30 behind a new show at 9 o'clock. So I was kind of upset with the way that CBS was treating Newhart. So it was around Christmas time, and we were going to a, a party in Beverly Hills. And we were waiting in line because you have your picture taken with the host and host, Marvin Davis and his wife, was, whose house it was. And... Um, so we're waiting, and I said to Jim, I said, you know, I, th I think this is going to be the last year of the show. Uh, and and uh, instantaneously, uh, Jenny said, you ought to end the show with a dream sequence where you wake up in bed with Susie because there were so many inexplicable things to explain the... the uh, Stephanie was an heiress. Julie was an heiress who worked at the inn for some unknown reason. <laughs> uh, you had Tom Post and the handyman who didn't know how to do anything. And then you had Larry, Daryl, and Daryl who, to me, were straight out of deliverance. And what, and what they were doing in Vermont is... <laughs> I mean, there was a significant amount of cousins marrying cousins that resulted in... It's Larry Darrell and Darrell. So I said, to, I said, oh, honey, I said, that's a great idea. I said, that's what a great idea. And, and Susie happened to be at the party and we explained it to her and she said, she said, I'll be there in a New York minute. She said, if, if I'm in Timbuktu, I'll, I'll come back for, and, and that's what happened. Two years later, I kind of straightened out the problem with CBS. And then two years later in the eighth year, we, we used the, the final episode. Stand up, you're, you're always observing 
people. And like I mentioned, being on the beach and making mental notes. And um, I, I used to always say on stage, you know, it's, it's amazing that, you know, that, that's what we comedians do. We watch you people and then you, you pay money to watch us do you, you know. <laughs> you should just watch each other and leave us out of the, out of the mix. There are certain routines that just, that lend themselves to the telephone. So Abe Lincoln, certainly, um, King Kong, um, um, Sir Walter Raleigh. There, there are just, what happens is the, the audience participates. You know, in terms of McLuhan, it, it isn't a cold medium. It becomes a hot medium because the audience they aren't passively sitting back and watching something. They're involved in it because they're supplying the other end of the conversation, the unheard end of the conversation. And so when they applaud at the end of the routine, they're really applauding themselves for having figured out what was going on on the other, on the other end of the conversation. I think, I think it was Jack Benny who said... Um, A comic says funny things. A comedian says things funny. So I would think of myself as a comedian. I did a show called uh, Bob with, again, Tom Poston. His daughter was Lisa Kidrow before Friends. And even then, as with Julia, you could tell she had it. Whatever it is, whatever, I always say she heard the muse, because you could tell then that she, she knew how to do comedy. She, um, it's just funny how you can, you have an ear for it, when, and when you hear it, you, you, know, you know it, you know that person is going to, it just, it's a sound, it's, a, I don't know, it's a, and she was also, Lisa was also, in the final episode of Newhart, the somewhat celebrated final episode of Newhart, um, the, Larry Daryl and Daryl come back, and the two Daryls have girlfriends. First time Larry Daryl and Daryl and, and the, t the two girls are they're jabbering and jabbering and jabbering. And Larry, Daryl, and Daryl have never spoken. So in the final episode, and we knew it was the final episode, finally the Daryls turn to the girls and they say, shut up. So one of the girls was Lisa Kidra, one of the Daryls' girlfriends. George Goble came along, and prior to that, it was Milton Berle and Ed Wynn and those kind of stand-up comics. And then there was this, then all of a sudden this George Goble person kind of wandered on and kind of talked kind of softly and, and was hysterical. But here was this soft-spoken soft guy who people were, were laughing at. You didn't have to be in a woman's dress to get laughs. That was, 